How's it going, guys? My name is Tavares, and today we're trying to find out if you can turn a $500 Explorer into a trip car. Holy s***! <laughs> The sport of drifting, for lack of a better term, is the automotive equivalent of figure skating. It's stylish, fast, and it rides the line of what most people would consider safe. It is the perfect outlet for car enthusiasts without rich parents to try out the limits of their car on a bottom dollar budget. But how cheap is cheap? So let's say that I'm obsessed with owning a drift car, but I'm not me, and I don't have a fleet of cars that are real wheel drive at the ready. Let's say I only have a few hundred bucks and a hand-me-down SUV that I would get from a grandparent and four days to do it. Is it even possible to take a car that has no business going sideways and making yourself into a bottom dollar DK? You know what DK stands for? Donkey Kong. Drift King. Drift. What do you mean, Drift? To find out, I think I'm gonna need a little help. This guy, his name is Chris from a channel you might know called B is for Build. We did a cheap car challenge, uh, I think it was last year. I can't- Almost a year ago, yeah. Yeah, it feels like a million years ago. Yeah. But uh, we did a cheap car challenge where we went to California and uh, he had a G35, I had a Mustang and we just had a lot of fun. Time, we're doing a challenge where we work together and we're working together on this thing this is a 1999 Ford Explorer Sport we bought this thing for 500 bucks and we're gonna spend around that much to turn it into a drift monster so what do you think about this car I love it I'm, I'm already in love with it it's the perfect <laughs> drift nugget I will admit that this bad idea was my idea yeah. we used to slide one of these around corners when I was in high school it was my friend's mom's mm -hmm. car and boy do they slide so I thought you know what Miata's overdone 240's too expensive let's get a Ford Explorer Freddie calls me back two days later because I found one for 500 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> so the good thing about these cars is even though they're SUVs and they have a really high roll center they are manual. This one is a five-speed manual and it is rear wheel drive. So that helps out a lot. And it also has a four liter V6, which makes a decent amount of torque. Yeah. We just have to make it low and slidey and also maybe a little more racy. And uh, we have to do it all in four days because on the fifth day, we're going to a drift course or rather a road course that we're gonna turn into a drift course. Yep. And uh, we're gonna see how well it slides or how well we can make it slide. Today, um, we're gonna go over everything the car needs as far as maintenance. That's what we're gonna be working on today and uh, hopefully we don't bite off more than we can chew. Here she is. This is my pride and joy for the next four days. And it is a decent enough example of what I consider to be a drift SUV, even though I don't think that's actually a thing. So this was 500 bucks. And as you can see, it is $500 worth of awesomeness. This dash, uh, not exactly the best example of uh, built Ford Tough. I think this has some uh, <laughs> some choice modifications. Uh, an interesting tidbit is that the windows do not work. And when I first got the car, I had to drive it an hour in really cold rain. We actually had a cold spell here in Florida and uh, I had to drive the car back home about an hour with no windows. Well, it was interesting. Take a look. All right, I don't know if you guys can hear me, but this is pretty scary. I am in my brand new 1998 or 99 Ford Explorer that I just bought for $500 and I'm driving it home. And as you can see, it's a bit rainy and it's very, very cold in here because the windows are rolled all the way down and I can't roll them back up. This is, the, oh my God, this is so bad. So I'm trying to maintain the speed limit as much as I can, but the brakes don't seem to be consistent at all. Either they're really, really touchy or they don't work at all. So it's really a crapshoot with these brakes. This car needs so much work. So it got a lot windier and a lot colder, but I'm almost home. And uh, the window behind me is actually not connected to anything. Uh, it's just flapping around in the breeze. Let me see if you can get a shot of that. Yeah, this is, uh, this is the worst car I have ever bought 
Forget the MR2, forget anything else. This is, oh God, I'm trying to break, 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 break. So as you can see, this is the interior and we have an awesome 12 ball shifter. And uh, I don't know what's wrong with the eight ball shifter. Maybe this one is for better, but the radio is non-existent. It looks like it's been punched in by the Hulk. Uh, the AC is non-existent, even though I do have an extra, well, not an extra, but a little knob here that controls both this and this, so you have to switch between them. AC don't work. Heater works through these heater vents. The vents aren't in great shape. Neither is this, neither is the dash, and neither are the seats, which looks like they got attacked by rabid cheetahs. Uh, also, the headliner is, uh, I don't, I, I don't know the story there, but this is a very good platform for a drift SUV because it is rear wheel drive and it has an interesting suspension setup in which it doesn't really have struts and springs, but it has a torsion beam in the front and a uh, leaf spring setup in the rear. So lowering it, it's gonna be actually quite easy. At least I think so. I'm, I don't wanna jinx myself, but uh, lowering it should be a little easier than changing out struts and springs and it definitely will be cheaper. All right, so we have the truck in my garage and it's the tallest thing that I've ever had in here. It's, uh, it's actually quite comical. All right, now we're gonna tackle some maintenance and that is gonna be the uh, spark plugs, oil change and filter. We're gonna do uh, rear pads and rotors because that is 100% necessary in drifting. And we're gonna do front pads as well because we don't wanna crash. The first thing you'll need to do for any drift nugget tune-up is make sure the fluids are topped up and fresh. We filled the mysteriously empty power steering reservoir, then drained the old engine oil and put some fresh 10W30 and a new filter for what could very likely be this car's final few days. Just for good measure, we also changed the spark plugs with some new and cheap NGK coppers. Let's be honest, the last thing you want is a misfire when you're going sideways at Redline. All right, so we are done with basically everything. We have a battery tender on here just to make sure that the battery doesn't uh, doesn't conk out on us. And there's Chris. <laughs> I have named this car and its name is Dora. <laughs> Her name rather. Dora the Explorer. Since uh, since Dora has seen better days, what we're gonna do now is uh, we are going to uh, do the brakes, but I think before then, we're gonna tackle the interior, meaning that we're just going to take the interior apart. We're gonna kill it. Yeah, we are definitely, definitely gonna kill it. And uh, step number one is trying to get this open because um, it's it's not openable at this Dibs. point in time. Dibs, I'll do it. Okay. Chris is gonna do it. There's no kind of, uh, the, the door handle doesn't work from the outside. There doesn't seem to be any handles and stuff like that. But I, I went under here, I found some different rods and pieces. Um, Freddie, if you do the honors, we need to try and undo the power locks. How much money you got in your pocket? A lot, why? I'm gonna need some of it. <laughs> to get me out of here? Which way are we going? Are you opening up the, wait, something happened. Whoa! Ah, there we go. There we go. Three me. All right. I'm gonna open it slowly. I don't know. What's I don't see on. any shocks. Oh God, this is heavy. There are no shocks to hold. There it. are no shocks. Let's find a prop to prop that open. I mean, I could I could just do this for the rest of the day. Why don't we just take this this whole thing off right now? There we go. All right, we got the back gate open and. Ew! 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 What the hell is that? Stripping a car's interior is super easy when you know it's all going in the trash. Make sure to wear gloves and work in a ventilated area because the last thing you want is some rare disease from mold that conveniently only lives in neglected old beaters. You'll also want to use power tools as they'll be your best friend to take off stubborn bolts. Or not. After removing the plastic side panels that, no joke, were the largest single piece interior panels I've ever seen on a car, we took off the headliner, which was basically half a headliner at this point, and removed the carpet, which was the most disgusting, roach infested, moldy mess I've ever seen anywhere, much less a car that someone would actually get in and drive. So, Chris, how do you feel? Uh, dirty. Dirty. I'm like, I might have taken five years off my life. Yeah, it's, it's seriously, seriously bad. Uh, I. 
my eyes are watering. I can't even think straight. Yeah, you guys on film can't tell, but your eyes legitimately water when they're back there. I've never had that experience in my life. When the interior was fully gutted and I made sure that every last roach in the car was thoroughly nuked, we put our efforts towards improving the Explorer's disgusting seats. And when I say we, I mean Chris. We got the big driver's seat out and these seats are uh, not gonna be very good for holding us into the car when we're drifting. It's a pretty big concern. We don't wanna be flying around in the cabin of that. Uh, so what we did was we uninstalled the seat rail and it's a really, really good kind of seat rail construction uh, to be applied to a different seat. So we're gonna grab some seats out of his uh, MR2 parts car, uh, set them on the rail and see if we can't get the MR2 seats on these seat rails to fit back into the car. All right, moment of truth. We're putting in the new seat from the MR2 and uh, we got everything out of that car. This is, uh, it's been an interesting day. It's, uh, it's, it's been a, it's been a World first MR2 seats in a Ford Explorer. Uh, you saw me in there, I was, I was using it. Um, it's great, everything. The measurements are good. It gets us in a good spot in the car and it holds us in there nicely. Great spot to the shifter. They are not disgusting like the other seats as well. They don't have cockroaches in them. Oh yeah, that's, that's always a good thing. Yeah. So we got a lot done yesterday and today we are doing a lot more. This is gonna be the last time you guys see this in its stock height, well, hopefully. We're gonna be doing a three inch to five inch drop on this thing. Uh, we're gonna be doing brakes and we're also gonna be doing a hydro e-brake. Now the hydro e-brake is, it's an interesting one because I'm pretty sure this is gonna be the first hydro e-brake ever installed on a Ford Explorer. Hydro e-brake is what makes drifting, drifting. It, it basically locks up the rear wheels and instead of you having to use the regular handbrake or in this case a foot brake, you would just have a hydraulic cylinder, uh, which is like a master cylinder inside the car and uh, use it by operating it with your hand like that. All right underneath the car and it actually doesn't look too bad. Everything is relatively rust free, uh, relatively oil free other than this, uh, this diff. What we're doing is we're modifying this mono leaf spring and the leaf spring is, I think there should be more leaf springs because uh, there are four spacers the size of leaf springs. So uh, what I think happened was Ford had a set height uh, for these Ford Explorers, but since the weights uh, were so different between models, between uh, four wheel drive and uh, four doors and two doors, then this is the lightest of them all. So they just put these four spacers with one leaf spring and uh, that's how they did it to cut costs. But this is really, really rudimentary. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use these three inch universal spacers uh, and we're just gonna put them on top of the leaf spring uh, in between the axle and hopefully everything should work and that should lower the back and then we're gonna do the front. While dumping your Ford Explorer on its wheel arches may be easy, you still wanna be safe. Make sure you support the weight of the car and the weight of the axle. Then remove the U-bolt nuts and gently lower the car while trying not to slow yourself when this happens. Then you can install your universal lowering blocks and actually, I'll let Chris explain. Quick status update, so here's how this works. We go ahead and raise up the body of the car and then uh, undo all the four bolts um, on this plate thing right here. That'll let that drop down and then we support the diff, lower the car, punching the diff and the axles up into the air and then we put in that three inch spacer right there. So now what we're doing is we're boring out the bolt holes on that uh, backup plate that's the plate that bolts into right there and then we'll reattach it right there cool. lowering blocks are installed let me show you how ridiculous it looks look at that lowering welcome to your ford explorer <laughs> this is what we need to do guys so fronts uh, still you know we're gonna work on the fronts next but we got the back nailed 
That's drift spec right there. Now I'm about to lower the front suspension of Dora here, and uh, it has a little bit of an unconventional suspension. Well, actually a really rudimentary suspension because unlike normal cars with coilover suspensions where you have a coil and a strut, this has something called a torsion bar suspension. And it uses two long bars, one on each side, and the twist between them um, creates the ride height. So what I'm gonna do to change the ride height in this is just change the relationship between the torsion bar and a torsion bar adjuster. I'm gonna show you what I mean. Okay, so right behind me are the torsion bars. This is one of them and this is the other one. They are two large bars just going from the basically middle of the car uh, or truck to the front and uh, they attach to the front control arm and they dictate how low or how high the car can go. I <laughs> call it a car again. So this piece has an exposed section because I took off the cover and you can see the torsion bar adjuster right here. Now a common thing to get these cars super low is uh, to just have these adjusters flip from side to side. And I'm not sure if we're gonna do that just yet. I'm not sure if we need to get it that low uh, because I do want it to have a uh, really good stance with the three inch drop in the back. And I think we might be able to get a three inch drop in the front by just undoing these adjustment bolts and letting it go all the way down to its lowest adjustment. This, uh, this might take a while. Looking good so far. Oh, it's pretty damn good, dude. It? Yeah, and it'll level out more as we drive. It's a drastic drop though. It's almost matching the back. Awesome. So that means we almost got three inches. Um, we did read online that as you drive, this will uh, level out more, settle a yes. little bit more. Um, but yeah, Freddie, I think you're gonna be real happy with what you see here. That ain't bad. No, that look, look at it compared to the back. That's a three inch drop over there. That's two and a half at that, least. That is, that is manageable. That is, that is very good. And. That basically took like no time at all. It's like 20 minutes. That's it's awesome. Just two bolts and it's absolutely free. Yeah. That, that's what Even if that doesn't lower down anymore, that is 100% driftable right there. Oh yeah, that's, yeah. that's 100% better. And uh, this improves our roll. Uh, yeah, yeah, the so, center of roll. Yeah, mass. Yeah. Yeah, and it actually looks a lot better. I, it I does. Kind of, it looks like it. it. Boys, we lowered an explore. This is our hydro e-brake right here. Um, one of these is an inlet, one of these is an outlet. Uh, I'll figure that out later. And that is gonna land somewhere in this very dark car that's way up top. So what I'm gonna do for now though, is I'm gonna crawl underneath and we gotta access the brake line. So you can see we had a fuel line here and a fuel line here. So it has a return fuel system. And then we have the brake line right here. So in this car, you have two dedicated brake lines up front. One goes to the front right, one goes to the front left. And this uh, thing right here, this brake line goes to the rear, controls both rear. So we only need to tap into this one when we pull our hydro e-brake, it's gonna pressurize this brake line, uh, which will lead to both the back wheels and lock them up. So what I'm gonna do first is uh, drain the brake system by cutting this line in half and capturing the fluid, and that'll let me tee off through this line. Actually, we're not really teeing off, but we're kind of rerouting it. Now that you're staring at a cut brake cable, don't panic. Clean up any corrosion for the outside of the line with a wire brush, then you can install the fitting and use a brake line flaring tool to give your line the correct flare to connect to the hydro e-brake assembly. You can then run it into the car, install a fitting on the other side, flare that, and attach it to the brake master cylinder. This install should go really, really smoothly unless for some reason you make car videos on YouTube. Oh man, bad news on the hydro e-brake front, guys. Once we started bleeding the brakes, applying pressure to the system, I saw a leak coming out of this side of the, um, the cylinder there, and that was because this fitting right here didn't have enough depth to crush our flared piece into uh, the center of that. And so what happened is we got a leak. So you can see that I took like a quarter inch off of the top of this here, uh, and that actually worked, but then when I went to apply enough pressure to really get the crimp down to stop the leaking, I blew out the threads on our cheap aluminum hydro e-brake. Thankfully, I don't live in a carless wasteland and rare car parts, even ones for Ford Explorer drift cars are easily found at local speed shops like Injuku Racing. The guys there were kind enough to donate an awesome drift spec hydraulic handbrake assembly with all the fittings to make sure our Dora went sideways in a hurry. After installing new rotors and bleeding the system, it was the moment of truth for our new mod. Ready, if you could spin the wheel, please. <laughs> all right, ready? Yeah. <laughs> all right, nice. All right. One more all right. time. One more time. All right. <laughs> nice. Oh, that's awesome. What about what about using it as a parking brake? Parking brake. 
quick, pretty easy. There we go. And you Bam! Hit. Look at that! Nice. Kill this birds with one stone. Welcome to the last day of the build. So what Chris is doing right now, he's uh, sprucing up the interior with some modifications we got from the ricer section at AutoZone. And the car is in the air because we had to do some uh, brake bleeding and some uh, more technical stuff. And you can see all that on his channel uh, where he explains all the trials and tribulations we went through. But just look at this thing. I, I really do love the aesthetic of this car. I think if we went with a different theme or something more outlandish, it would take away from the $500 uh, cheap drift nugget that it is. And I think we really want to preserve that. So I think um, after the mechanical mods, we're just going to make this into a drift SUV sleeper. And what drift car would be complete without an air intake system that's modified from stock? Now this is our stock intake system and it's missing the air box. It did come with an air box, but we took it out because we're gonna put something that flows a little bit better and sounds a little bit better because as any Ford Explorer owner knows, it's not about looking good. It's about sounding good too. But in all seriousness, what we need to keep those rear wheels spinning is a little bit more power and an engine, an internal combustion engine is basically an air pump, meaning that the more air it takes in and the more air it can get out, the faster and the more power it makes and that will uh, make lots and lots of skids. So we're going to remove that restrictive air box, uh, which just had a regular panel air filter, and we're gonna replace it with this. This is a more free-flowing uh, cone filter that I just got from my local auto parts store with a universal MAF adapter, mass airflow adapter. And that goes on this mass airflow sensor right here. And that's basically gonna sandwich in like this. But the install of this is pretty easy, and it is, uh, since this is universal, um, it can go on any car. So what I'm gonna have to do is mark off where these holes there's little holes here for the MAF adapter. Uh, mark off where the holes go, uh, drill them through, then use nuts and bolts, and uh, we should be good to go for the air intake install. Da -da 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 -da. Installing an air intake. Looks good. Freddie just finished up on uh, on bolting this baby in here. It looks it looks like it was meant to be in there. Freddie pointed out something pretty cool. If you look down here, there's a little snorkel. Well, you can't see down there, but trust me, there's a little snorkel that actually pulls in the cooler air from the system, and it's going to bring it up to our short ram. So that. Actually Actually, it looks like it was meant to be on there. That's not bad. Nice job, Freddy. Now let me show you how we're gonna take off that exhaust. Actually, Chris, I got it. Ah, this lighting makes me look like I'm telling a ghost story. Once upon a time, there was an exhaust that was so restrictive, it made no power at all. We can't have the intake without the exhaust as well, and uh, we are gonna modify the exhaust. This is the stock exhaust, and it looks like it has four or five million catalytic converters. Yeah, this is a lot. So there's two cats right here, one cat right here, and another cat right here. I'm not sure if these are all cats or resonators or what, but there's also a big muffler box right here, and then a very, very long tailpipe. So what we're gonna do now is unbolt the flange on what looks like the third catalytic converter and just run a nice uh, straight section of two and a half inch. And also we have a cherry bomb. Give me that cherry bomb. Give it. Oh. Yeah, we have a cherry bomb. Yeah, uh, this is a cherry bomb glass pack. And as you can see, it is straight through, except for some uh, resonator and fiberglass sections, which should decrease the drone and make the sound a little bit more rotty. I'm not sure how well it's gonna do, just because we're gonna go straight out into the atmosphere after that. But uh, yeah, this should be a lot louder. Soaking bolts in PV Blaster or WD-40 is a must if you're dealing with an older car like this but Dora was pretty rust free, so I only broke one bolt while removing the exhaust that looked like it had 4,000 catalytic converters on it and flowed worse than a dirt-filled sock. Chris then took it upon himself to cut the flange off at the cat, and then he used some very precision instruments to get our new parts to fit. After that, it's a bit more grinding, a bit more welding, and bam one custom made glass pack exhaust dump. Gee, working on this car sure is exhausting. Exhaust almost done. I'm gonna put it uh, where it belongs, back in its home. But before I do that, I'm gonna give it a nice lick of exhaust cement. Now, usually you need a gasket to put on this mating surface, but since we don't have a gasket and the old gasket doesn't really wanna come off all that well, 
and uh, we don't really care about uh, this making a perfect seal because <laughs> basically two feet later it just goes out into the world. Uh, we're just gonna use some exhaust cement and uh, bolt it down. So the keen observers among you will notice that one of the bolts is different in length and thread pitch and size because it broke when we tried to take it off. So uh, we just welded one of these bolts and it should be good to go. So behind me is Chris and he's working on something that I absolutely dread. He's taking apart the rear differential. He's taking the rear cover off and all that nasty 250,000 mile, probably never been changed fluid is gonna come out and it's gonna stink up my garage. But after we clean all that out, then we get to weld the diff because we're gonna turn it into a locking diff from an open differential. If you don't know what a locking diff is, you can check out his channel. He does a little bit of an explainer uh, what a locking diff is, what an LSD is, and also what an open differential is. But uh, for the layman amongst you, a locking diff basically means that if one wheel turns one way, the other, the other wheel turns exactly the same way, uh, meaning that it's really good for drifting. It's not so good for daily driving uh, because you want some sort of slippage between the wheels. You want one wheel to turn a little bit more than the other when you're turning. But uh, if you want to drift, it's exactly what you need. And that's what we're putting on this car. And uh, to do that, we have to weld the uh, interior structure. We have to weld the spider gears inside the differential. And it's a very popular mod. It's actually pretty easy from what the internet tells me. I've never, never actually done it before, but uh, Chris is here to, uh, to do all that and also make my garage smell really, really bad. So this is what it looks like when you go ahead and weld up the spider gear. So you can see I kind of went for like up there, down there, down there, down there, and anywhere I could. You don't want to use a flux core on this because you get a lot of slag. That's for a differential that you really care about. Since we don't care too much about this, that slag is going to knock around in there and eventually end up in the bottom of that pan down there. And uh, I'm calling it not a big deal. So another thing that you can do is you can take a plate and cut a square plate put that in there and weld it all the way around, especially if you have a talented welder. But I'm not one of those, so we're not even gonna worry about doing that. Especially with these tires that we're running, I don't think we're gonna put that much pressure on the diff to be able to pop it and break all these welds. Cause they are actually pretty, pretty beefy welds. They actually came together pretty good. So that's it. Now what we do is go ahead and put the car into neutral. Freddie, do you wanna try and spin that? We might be able to spin it now. Whoa. So you can see how it spins as one unit now. That's what I was talking about before. So go ahead and spin it to the other side and I'll weld the other side up. Is that it? No, no keep spinning. Yeah, that's, that's my new target. Car is on the ground. We have the intake, we have the exhaust, we have the LSD, not, uh, not limited slip differential, but locking slip differential. And uh, we have the car lowered. This is the first start. <laughs> That was like 1,000 RPMs. That's like 1,000. Oh <laughs> we can't go very loud, can we? No. All right. All right, we're done here. This was it. The culmination of four long days and nights working on a cheap and ridiculous dream to strip and convert a $500 beater with a high rollover risk into an SUV that lives for going sideways. It was no longer an eyesore, but a purposeful machine made to do one thing and one thing well. And what better place to test it than the Florida International Rally and Motorsports Park, an awesome track with pristine sweepers, tight bends, and rally stages. It was all ours for the day, and we intended to use every second for destroying tires. That is, until we broke the car. And when I say we, I mean Chris. Welcome to the inside of the car. Uh, I'm kind of the test dummy here. No one knows if this car will roll over. This is the suspension. You could just rock in the seat and really get the car to move. Um, I will say it is the sketchiest car that I've ever driven in. The brakes only work in the back. So you can jab the brakes and it'll stop, but it'll only stop the back. So we didn't really need the hydro, but it works as a great parking brake anyways. Now, can it drift? I'm gonna see if it can do donuts first and then we'll see if it can drift. So let's see what I can do out here. Control valve. 
actually. Oh yeah, yeah, that'll be a, that'll do it. Uh, what'll do? Oh, told you three oh. bolts. Told you three bolts was a problem. Okay. Um. Hmm. That uh, that's not great. So we are um limping back to oh the pits. Oh my god, you feel it stepping out? Oh, dude. Dude, that is not good. Uh, By far the most dangerous car I've ever driven in my life. So I think uh, what Chris did is he pizzaed instead of french frying and he had a bad time. So right now we're limping the car back to the pits. Uh, one of the bolts is uh, just off on the suspension on our $30 uh, three inch drop. So listen, uh, don't be pointing fingers here, Mr. Axle Wrap. Okay. Hey, you're the one that installed the three inch drop. Okay, all right. You know what? D take that up with AutoZone or I'm blaming everyone but me. Right now, hopefully we can get this worked out. If not, then we'll have to finish off this car in a uh, in a Viking funeral sort of Royal way. Style. Yeah, but uh, I didn't even get to drive it. <laughs> I didn't even get to do any donuts or anything. Uh, how's the alignment on this car? Oh, it's great. See, if you turn left, the back floats out like 15 feet. <laughs> After limping Dora back into the pits, we took off the wheel, removed the U-bolt that went from an Innie into an Audi, and used the only tools available, with extreme precision, of course. I feel like an eight. That's getting real close. I think that's, I think that's workable. Honestly, let's try it. Yeah. Wouldn't you know it, an old lug nut works perfectly to secure a broken U-bolt. All you need to do is start threading, then cross thread it like your life depends on it, then pray that it works. Good thing it did. All right, it's fixed, it's running, and it's back on the track. So uh, in order to get this sliding around, I actually consulted a drifter. I guess you can call yourself a drifter. Hey, 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 I guess. So a, uh, I guess, drifter um, told us that instead of doing it on dry pavement, since that car doesn't have a ton of power, doesn't have a lot of the right tires, and it also doesn't have... That, I just want you guys to brake stuff. Okay, so... Dirt since... is way less abusive because there's way less, like, uh, I don't know... Traction? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to try it on dirt first. And I think it should be pretty good because this has a rally-like... Uh, Stance, I guess it's uh, it's a little bit lower from stock, but it still is way taller than any drift car I know. So uh, we're gonna put it on the dirt and we're gonna see what she does. Ready for a go for a rip? Let's do it! <laughs> oh yeah! As it turned out, the brakes were dragging and glazing over, and as the strongest brakes on this car were in the rear and we didn't want to do anything dangerous, we had to tuck our tail between our legs and end the day. But then we... car had thoroughly proved itself in going insanely sideways with all four wheels on the ground, we found another cool feature of the track. Would you look at that? We got ourselves a rally jump. So FIRM actually stands for Florida International Rally Motorsports Park, I think. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So uh, there's a jump here. Yeah. And uh, rock, paper, scissors, just see who jumps first. Yeah. All right, let's do it. Okay. Rock, paper, scissors. What? Oh, did <laughs> I go early? Yeah. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Ah, I gotcha. All right. All right, I'll jump first. 
Okay, he's jumping first. I don't know if I'm gonna jump it, guys. I just kinda wanna film this. Um, it's gonna be pretty radical. All right. Have you ever jumped a car before, Chris? Um, yes. Oh, uh, okay. uh, it didn't go well. Was it a Ford Explorer? No, it wasn't a Ford Explorer. It was a Suzuki Swift, and it just dug right in, impact bar into the dirt. Okay, that's not gonna happen here because we have a Ford Explorer, and it's way better. I yeah, wanna see who's gonna get more air. Huh? Who's okay. gonna get more air? I don't know. So the guy said we have to try start slow and then get bigger. So I'm, I'm gonna start slow and then get bigger. All right, we only got 15 minutes. Let's do it. Yeah, let's go. It was clear that Chris was going the cautious route. Nevertheless, he persisted. After his third attempt, Dora really wasn't happy, and we all thought, all right, now it's time to pack it up and go home. But then we... As the day wore on, it became abundantly clear that Dora was the perfect example of what we set out to do just four days prior. Two amateur mechanics started a budget build and made a car that put a smile on the faces of not only the clowns who made it, but new friends as well. It tried us, it tested our patience and resolve, and even though it got dangerously close to coming undone in the 11th hour, the epic payoff was definitely worth the small price of admission. And I hope everyone watching this is inspired to take a step back every once in a while and enjoy a good laugh with great friends. Thank you for watching, and as always, wrench every day.